Okay, there's a smile. That's the David I know. There's Mr. Bruno. Brett. Hi, Brett. Hey, Brett. You're muted, Bruno. That's right. probably the good thing. Can you guys hear me okay? Ah, there he is. <laughs> I hear you great, no. Bruno. All right, thank you. You sound better than last time. Hi, Bruno. Hey there. Boy, the same beautiful faces. I nice see that Robert came out of the uh, the dark. Came out of the dark. Came out of the closet. <laughs> All right, folks. Hey, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome uh, to the second seminar of our uh, winter seminar series. Um, uh, just a little bit of bookkeeping uh, before we start up. Uh, we have another seminar coming up uh, next week. Uh, that's going to be uh, next Wednesday um, at the same time, and that will be uh, Lynn Alley, and he'll be doing his uh, his classic uh, wave soaring seminar. Um, uh, again, uh, as a reminder, uh, we are recording this, so uh, please don't don't say something that that you might regret later because it's going to be posted to YouTube, and and the whole world is going to be watching. So tonight uh, we have Paul Schneider, who will be presenting on uh, soaring around Heber. Uh, Paul is the the chief instructor out of Heber. Um, he is uh, formerly a air traffic controller. Um, and he's going to be talking uh, uh, at least uh, some uh, aspects of good communication skills, um, which uh, apply everywhere, not, not just Heber. So, so that's going to be one thing that he's going to touch on. So I would say that as an air traffic controller, he is an expert more than most. Um, I'm sure Paul's seen some good communication and maybe a lot of bad communication too. So uh, I'm super excited about that, Paul. Um, Paul uh, flies an LS-8 uh, around around Heber. Correct me if I'm wrong, an LS-8, right, Paul? Yep, that's it. Yep, um, it's, it's a beautiful airplane. Um, for, for you guys who don't know, the LS-8 is the one with the weird curved wing tips. So kind of kind of a, a different looking airplane, um, but a, a beautiful flyer. Uh, Paul, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, start? All right, well, Art, thanks a lot for letting me share a little bit about Heber and uh, what I know and what I want to try to give to uh, the rest of the club here and anybody else that might be listening. You know, the first thing that we need to do, though, is we need to name these presentations. So I've uh, got a lot of different bars up down at the bottom of my computer, and I'm going to start going back and forth. And I did try to put together a little PowerPoint with some slides. So the first thing that I think we should do is name our presentations. So I think all the presentations that we're doing here in the next few weeks should be named the art of Utah soaring. I, I assume you're naming them after me. Is that right, Paul? That's for you, Mr. Right. Thank you so much for hosting these and uh, putting them together. We really appreciate it. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, a bit of background. Uh, I've been soaring since 1995. I was a convert from Powerplane and Dave Robinson of Soar Utah was uh, instrumental in me getting all of my add-ons from uh, commercial into a CFIG. Uh, it started in 1995 up until the present time, and I love soaring here and at the other sites, although I've never been up at Logan. I've been there uh, in airplanes and that, but I've never flown out of Logan, so that's my next venture. Uh, tonight's presentation, I thought I'd touch a little bit on the history of soaring in Heber. Uh, some of the operations present day, some of the traps that we have, uh, you know, the hot spots, so to speak, and uh, what the jet traffic is that is pretty substantial compared to most other airports that the Utah Soaring Association is flying out of now. Logan possibly has some of the jet traffic, but I tell you, since COVID hit last April, May, our jet traffic in Heber has increased 30 to 40 percent. And it's not small jet, it's, you know, the G5, uh, big Falcons, that type, along with the smaller jets too. So I want to touch on that a little bit. Uh, we'll talk some of the flow around Heber, the IFR flows, uh, in and out of Heber, and, you know, what normal soaring might look like if you're a newbie to, to us. And I do have a sectional chart that I'll be able to bring up 
and show some of that. Uh, what we do to get back into the airport, uh, I have a few slides that we can touch on on that. And then also uh, I want to touch base and give everybody the contact information for SOAR Utah because Dave Robinson is our tow plane there. Unless you have a motor glider, uh, Dave runs SOAR Utah Incorporated and he is wanting to uh, keep his business open. So I hope People can get down, use the club ship, and possibly bring their own gliders down if they have. The last thing tonight I want to touch on is communication. And again, Art shared a little bit of my background. I think it's paramount that we, as a glider community, set the bar, set the example on what it you know, should sound like and not jam up our frequencies. So I a little uh, document just to give everybody something to think about, ponder and they can print it out later, share it with other people. So, here we go. Uh, Heber Valley, it's uh, probably one of the most beautiful places to soar in Utah. You know, I'm obviously biased, but we have mountains on all sides of us, uh, great ridges that we can get off on, uh, get up to altitude, and just have a just a splendid time, even in the club shit, two to three hour Flights in the Heber Valley, you know, after 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon are really easy to do. Uh, let me escape this. And oh, I wanted to show one more. Uh, soaring in Utah started in 1927. Uh, Frank Kelsey, let me go through this again, was pretty instrumental in starting it out. Uh, he and Lee Stortz, John Milden, some of the other names that people have probably heard, uh, really started our sport. Heber came about in about 1965. They bounced around different airports around from Wendover to Nephi they used to soar at. And they ended up, you know, buying, uh, I believe, a 126 and, you know, basing it out in a 233 up at the Heber Airport. So with that, let me get back into this. This is what it looked like then There's in 1982. Hey, hey, Paul, um, let me just stop you just really quick. Um, at the bottom of your screen, do you see the thing that says stop sharing, the button? And then to the right, it says hide. Thank you. What about it? Yeah, go ahead and press that. It's kind of blocking people's view. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Thank, thank you, yeah, for Bruno, for bringing that to my attention. Yeah, this is a shot of Heber, and it's in the document that's uh, listed on the Utah Soaring Association website under Club Info. And this was a shot taken in 1982, and it commemorated the 50-year anniversary of a soaring society of Heber. So you can see the airport here. Uh, hangar rows, where I have a hangar now, are located here. The ramp is all ripped up. This is the old FBO building, some of the old hangars here. But you can see how active this airport was. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty active up until about the early 90s when a new operator came in and built a huge FBO along with the city, you know, starting to build a hangar row at this end and then subsequently a lot more hangars down to the south end. I think we have over 90 hangars on the airport now. And I believe we have probably eight to 10 gliders based here, two or three motor gliders also. So it's still a presence in the Heber Valley, and I know the people of Heber Valley, they always think about, oh yeah, sailplanes. We see them all the time up there. We used to see them all the time. So, you know, Heber is a, a big uh, asset to our community. Oops. And I just wanted to sort of plug that because it, it, and we do have our nuances, so let's touch base a little bit about that. know how to get to each slide so I'm just gonna have to go through back again so from about the early 90s uh, through the mid 2010-2011 uh, SOAR Utah did it advertise and promote soaring with private toes club toes and also rides and this is a picture of one of our ride pilots Tom Meekum I don't know if he was able to get on tonight or not but I uh, just wanted to honor him for giving thousands and thousands of glider rides to people from all over the world, 
that uh, came to Park City in the Heber Valley. And I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Tommy. So there you go, brother. Hope you're doing okay. Again, active pilots we have probably eight to ten. Uh, a lot of them have their own ships. Um, the Heber Airport has tie down space at the north end for trailers. Uh, as of now, there has not been any charge, but I believe the city is going to be asking for a $25 a month fee to tie a glider down at the north end. It's a grassy area that's fairly level, uh, similar to what you do in Nephi if you're putting together a glider out in the grass in that area. <coughs> and uh, so if anybody wants to base their glider up here, we do have access to it. The procedure then to soar out of Utah would be get a hold of Dave Robinson to make sure he's towing. I'll cover that a little bit later. And then he has a golf cart uh, that we're able to use to get gliders, uh, the club glider also tied up at the north end out in the grass, uh, to stage gliders down at Taxiway Alpha 2. Here's Julie after a flight that we had down a couple of years ago. So normal Paul, procedure there. Our, Paul, do we need to bring our own stakes for the tie down area? Uh, yes, it's a, a completely open grass field. Uh, the club ship, we have some permanent tie downs that I put in, but if you do have a uh, private glider, then you bring your own stakes for the trailer and your glider if you're going to keep it out overnight. Most guys and gals take their gliders apart every night, but if you want to keep it out, you know, bring your own tie downs. Key um, Valley has a mix of aircraft, and I think everybody is concerned with that. You know, we're operating from gliders to small single engine tail draggers. There's a Warburg Museum, Commemorative Air Force, that has a T6 Stearman's, a couple of other Warbirds, uh, Yak, and other Warbirds are in the area. So we get a huge mix of traffic. I think with you know, proper planning, with good communication, uh, we can all fit into the airport. Um, I know Dave Robinson of Soar, Utah, is adamant, adamant about being a good neighbor to our flying community. And so if we're out at Alpha 2 and there's uh, traffic in the pattern, Dave may let that traffic do two or three touch and goes and then make a comment saying, hey, we're ready to launch at Alpha 2. So we are going to be good neighbors, uh, keep a low profile. We don't want to be, you know, the bad guys. Uh, we're gliders, you know, we're the good guys. So we're gonna try to keep that presence up in Heber. Safety, obviously, is the number one thing. Uh, with jet traffic, things move a lot faster. And uh, one of the other things that we have is the departures in and out of Heber. You know, they don't always arrive too, too on windy days. The uh, IFR departure out of Heber City, the Cooley one, departs off of four, and some companies think that they have to depart off of four because it's the IFR departure procedure. I don't know where some of these pilots get their information, but even with a 10 to 15 knot tailwind, they're taking off uphill, and we've seen Falcons and G5s rotate about tackle Alpha 2 up the north end to get up and down. So uh, be aware of that, one of the traps if we are flying a 2-2 operation at Heber City, jet traffic can and may be using runway 4 uh, non-wind dependent. Uh, it's very rare that we'll operate off of runway 4. This is a shot taken four or five years ago when we did have that north breeze. Uh, Dave is pretty reluctant to tow off of 4 unless people have experience of that. But uh, it is an option, and we can get trained if, you know, for some reason we get into that north flow scenario that we've seen in the last few years. Alrighty. Let me escape this and bring up one other thing here. I want to bring up the arrival in the Heber City. This is the GPS. What do they call it? The GP, RNAV GPS dash alpha A in the Heber City. So if you see uh, my cursor there, Zane, the initial approach fix, is in the, about the vicinity of Highway 40 and Highway 80, just northeast of the Park City area. And if you see Zane down on the profile, they're going to be 11 to 15,000 
in that area on their initial approach. They start their descent towards the Hebrew airport. The gray area is the Jordan L Reservoir, so about the dam, maybe a little bit north of the dam at Uziu, however you pronounce that, 9,400 feet. Again, going down to the missed approach point, which is Ifta, they'll be at 8,000 feet. The airport you can see is this small little line. <clears throat> and so the jets coming in on that IFR departure, even on good VFR days, a lot of them fly this depart or arrival procedure into the Hebrew Valley, ending up somewhere over our sewer ponds or one of our reporting points, and a lot of GA uses it, at 8,000 feet. So that's a pretty big trap for us if you're flying in the Hebrew airport, out of the Hebrew airport, on uh, knowing that the jet traffic coming in could down to this missed approach point and then subsequently make a right turn, enter right traffic and go up to about a five to six mile final and then land runway 22. That's predominant. Normally they won't land four unless they're hard north breeze. They will take off four, but normally they will you know, honor that, especially if there's a lot of other traffic, they're gonna, most of them comply with that. So just be aware that they're down to 8,000. Glider pilots were coming in from all different areas. We usually try to come in, enter the pattern, you know, around this area, the same area as our missed approach point, somewhere in the seven to 8,000 feet to get into a crosswind leg to land runway 22. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, they make the calls. Some of them then will break off at Fugi, just at the north end of the Heber Ridge there on the northeast end. They'll fly out long right base and then come in this way. And they are pretty good on the radio. So I just wanted to point that out. That's one of our hot spots, one of our big traps when you're flying in and out of the Heber Airport. Uh, the next slide, I'm going to open it, and I'm going to have to, again, click through and get back to it. But here, get to see all those great pictures again of the Heber Valley. This, this was produced by Salt Lake Air Traffic Control when uh, Bruno and I and a couple other people went down to the tower. We asked some of their procedures folks to produce an arrival track and departure tracks in and out of the Salt Lake uh, Airport. So this one shows arrivals and some departures over on the west side, but this is a north flow uh, arrival route over, I believe, I think Bruno was a 24 hour period. They just were able to track each one of the arrivals. So the Heber Airport is located, if you can see my cursor on the top of the page. Uh, if you do fly the club glider, normally you're not going to get into this flow, but if you're flying your own single seat and you want to get off and head south towards the, you know, the uh, Nephi area or down towards the plateau, you know, one of the routes that we take is just down these ridges and then jump across Spanish Fork Canyon where the Jet traffic and they can be descending to 14,000 in this area and then lower once they push past Spanish Fork and the Provo Airport. So, again, another hot spot if you are flying a single seat trying to cross, you know, from Heber to get down south, uh, be aware of that. There is a publication on communications that uh, we put up, Bruno and myself put up on the Utah Soaring Association site. It has this information along with a lot of. Uh, frequencies for Salt Lake Center. It's a couple, three years old. I haven't updated it. So, you know, if you're diligent and check your charts to find out what frequency center is on, get a hold of them, and at least for advisories. While I flew that last season several times, and the frequencies are still good. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I'm delighted when you call them. <laughs> they are. They uh, really are receptive to it if you're on your 1202 squawk. Uh, if they want you to change to a different squawk, I've always just said, you know, I'd rather just stay on 1202. Uh, they know we're out here on their radar scope. It is painting a blip along with a tag on it that says ELBR. So they know that that 1202 squawk is a glider and they would be, you know, watching out and providing some traffic advisories to the other aircraft and to us. This is a north flow departure. Uh, again, Heber Airport down in the bottom right. If you were to take off, and again, club ships, you're probably not going to get into a lot of this departure. But if you're in your single seat and you get up, kicked up over the 
Deer Valley snowbird area up to 13, 14,000 feet, start heading up towards Morgan and then Logan if you want to take a northerly flight. This area in, in, in here, jets will be climbing out of about 10 to 15,000 feet. So another hot spot if you're flying out of the Hebrew airport to be aware of. And uh, again, the frequency 135.5 is the departure frequency that you can monitor and check in with to try to get advisories. Um, obviously, this is over a 24 hour period, so it's not all like a shotgun blast coming out of there, but still, that could be one of our hot spots when we're flying in and out of Hebrew. All righty. This was a shot taken just coming up over Provo Peak, heading down uh, off the left wing of my glider down towards Spanish Fork Canyon. And again, some beautiful conditions that we have here. I highly recommend uh, if you can't get down from your site in your single seat, come down, get the club ship and uh, fly with us. Let's talk a little bit now on uh, normal club gliding that we have. And let me try to bring up my other slide that I have, 25%. So Heber Valley, you see in the middle, this was produced using an 18 to one glide ratio for gliders. So well, obviously the Grove is 35, 36 to one. Uh, I instruct at 15 to one, This these rings show an 18 to one glide ratio getting back to the Heber airport. A uh, normal procedure then for Eber is depart runway 22. The tow ship then will make a right climbing 360 degree turn back over the airport. And then on most days in the afternoon, we get the west southwesterly prevailing flow. So the tow plane will take you down into the Heber, excuse me, into the Wallsburg area. And in this area here, it's a beautiful ridge to get your first uh, home thermal to get some altitude. Uh, rock outcroppings come all the way down. Anybody that's flown here know that these rock outcroppings about one to two o'clock in the afternoon are like solar panels for our energy that we need in uh, thermals. Uh, they warm up, the wind comes up canyon, hit those things and they go off. So it's a great place to get off anywhere from the point. My normal is about a 2000 foot tow on good days, right at the point of the mountain down at this area, not Salt Lake's point of the mountain, but the point of the Wallsburg Ridge. And then from there, work my way up, get going. Even in the club glider, I might take a 75 or 8,000 foot tow. And one of the reporting points that we have is the Pines, which is five miles to the airport down in this area. And I recommend if you're flying the club glider uh, in this area, and I, let's see, let me get rid of that. You know, you take off, you're flying down the ridge, you're at the pines. I instruct my student in any checkouts that I give down here, even though the ring says 9,600, I wanna be at 10,000 before I take off the ridge. Uh, different ways then to get around the valley from here would be to get to that 10,000, backtrack, backtrack across the valley, north end of the Deer Creek Reservoir, over the Soldier Hollow area up towards Midway. This ridge here that goes up towards, we call it Terrace Mountain. I think it's uh, Mill Creek Peak is up in this area. Great, great soaring uh, thermals kicking off. So if you can get 10 in this glide, in the club glider, you're gonna lose 1,000 to 1,500 to get across the valley. Generally good thermals up this little gulch that we have here by the Cascade Springs area will get you back up to 10, 11, 12. And then from there, you know, obviously good soaring all over the mountains. If there is a very strong west northwesterly flow, this can be rougher than a corn cob up here in your glider, just because of the rotor turbulence coming off the Snowbird, uh, Brighton, you know, that area that we see that uh, spillover that we get. So that can be pretty rough in there if we get that strong west nor northwesterly flow. In a southerly flow, generally we're producing thermals and sure there's turbulence, but it's uh, still really good soaring in that area. Uh, the other thing then, a normal valley tour in the club glider would be take off Heber, do the thing, come down the ridge, 
back over the top, get out towards Brighton Snowbird. You're at 13, 11, somewhere in that area. Again, with the rings coming around, you can come across the Jordanelle, back over to the East Heber Ridge, back down through the Timber Lakes area, push down maybe a little bit towards Strawberry, Current Creek, Daniels Pass, back, and on a good day, cross back over towards, you know, Timpanogos. Uh, Timp works real well. It's just like Mount Nebo down in that uh, Nephi area. Uh, we get those strong uh, west southwesterly flows, and the ridge really works well. But if the wind does go out of the northwest, it doesn't work real well. I've been caught over there a few times and actually landed out at the Provo Airport because I got too low in this area, the Provo Peak area. I got a little bit too low below the rocks. And I just couldn't get back up again because of that, you know, hard northwest flow. So other areas then for uh, people that have their own single seats that are flying out of here, obviously, again, up to nine or 10,000, and then head out towards the Uintas. Again, uh, the Uintas, if you haven't flown them, it is tiger country out there. There's not a lot of pl places to land out. Uh, I chased Bruner out there one day, and he kept going, and I was at 14.5, you know, up over this area, the uh, Bald Mountain area. Yeah. And at 14, I just kept pushing, and, you know, I've been out further than that, but something, uh, Spidey Sense in me said, nah, time to turn back. Sure enough, I got caught in the downdraft when I came down towards the, the Shane Gulch down here, and I got about 11,000, and I was puckering, even in my LS8, because I was into a headwind. It was pretty hard to grab another thermal and get back. So make sure it's a really good day, good, strong forecast if you're going to go play out in Uintas. Uh, other people, good ways to get down into the Wasatch Plateau area is to take it down. This ridge works real well, jumping across Strawberry and then down towards the plateau uh, is a, one way to get there. I typically don't go out to the east uh, of Strawberry Reservoir. I hang more to the west side. Seems to work a lot better uh, from, from the, you know, to get down towards the plateau. All righty then. Here's a picture taken. Uh, altimeter says 17,650. We do get wave in the Heber Valley, generally in the fall from mid to late September through the end of October. And it's over the, uh, the secondary wave that we get is down over the Wallsburg Valley and it stretches sometimes all the way up towards Morgan. I've flown that uh, in the wave. So uh, just looking at, you can see Mount Timpanogos, Utah Lake, Cedar Valley Airport, you know, down in that area. So it's really a beautiful place to fly. And we have all conditions here from the convergence, ridge, thermal, uh, a lot of different conditions to fly in the Heber Valley. Arrivals into Heber. Uh, generally, when we're coming in, I'm going to come back to this uh, presentation that I had before on my rings. So Arriving into the Heber Valley and your gliders. <clears throat> a couple different ways to get into the pattern. Again, predominantly runway 2-2. Two, two. Uh, normally, we don't use a 45 entry into runway 2-2. Two, two. And the reason being is the ridge that we have, the Wallsburg Ridge, just to the south of the airport, if the wind is blowing pretty strong, there's some pretty severe downdraft rotors coming across that. And if you get on the back side of that, you can get kicked down pretty fast in this area. So if you do have the altitude, we like to go out and set up about two miles to the northwest over the uh, midway sewer ponds that we have out there, the square holding ponds, and then enter the traffic pattern in a crosswind leg and then normal downwind and base to final trend, land runway 2-2. Big kicker in the afternoons when we do have that uh, convection going on and we get big thunderstorms that you know, start out down in this area and they start move, moving across the Strawberry area 
building, 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 they tend to want to get big in here and then dissipate with all that wind and it falls right down Daniels Canyon here to the Heber Airport and we get direct crosswinds. We see that at, uh, down at Nephi coming off Nebo in the afternoons where that wind will just start sucking down the mountain from those thunderstorm buildups and then dissipating. So if we get that, traditionally we'll want, want to try to land to the north in that. If we do land to the south, again, make your, your own call, your pilot in command. But landing to the south, we have a line of hangars up at the north end of the Hebrew airport, and we get a lot of turbulence coming off those hangars, you know, within about 100 feet of the ground. So it's usually a runway four arrival on that. And uh, remember, always <laughs> uh, keep a lookout for that. If it looks really good and you see those thunderstorms building up to the south, southwest of the airport, keep an eye on them because they can get real big and they can dissipate and uh, very easy to uh, get yourself in trouble trying to land in that hard crosswind. Here's the information for Dave Robinson and SOAR Utah. I'll leave that up for a few minutes. Uh, Dave has been flying in the Hebrew Valley since the, I think the late 70s or 80s. Do a lot of rides, a lot of instruction. Subsequently bought SOAR Utah from a couple guys, I believe in the late 80s, or no, early 80s, he bought it. And he's been the uh, tow plane operator out of Heber Airport since then. Uh, good guy. He recently retired from the Alta Ski area and he's up at the airport a little bit more. So again, even on days I put down at the bottom, usually normally toes on Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, uh, May through October. You may give him a call. He may be putzing at the airport. He's insured, you know, through those times to, to tow. So even on odd days, he may be able to help you out. And again, he's the show to be able to get a golf cart. Uh, you'd park down at the store, you took, uh, <clears throat> take the golf cart and go up and retrieve the club glider <clears throat> and or your own personal glider. And then uh, anybody there around would help launch or, you know, it can be done solo. Also, the uh, wing down to park drop runway 2-2 at Taxiway Alpha 2. Phone number, email. That's Dave Robinson, commonly known as Hoopa. I don't know where it came from. There's the Hoopa Indians out of somewhere in Oregon or Idaho, but I don't think it was because of that. I think it's because of his laugh. He's got a very unique laugh. If you've ever heard Dave do his laughing there. And the last thing that I'd like to cover then is I'm getting into my safety talk and sort of. Uh, Getting ahead of Dave Cleveland, I saw that his one of his presentations was safety. So mine is about radio communications. <clears throat> if you've operated out of a lot of general aviation, smaller airports, you hear everything and anything on these radios. Uh, painting a verbal picture for other pilots, I think, is really paramount for us as the glider community and for any general aviation pilot flying in and out of airports to use standard phraseology in a sequential order that lets everybody know where the heck you are and what you're doing. You know, so the first thing is state the airport you're operating from. Second, state your call sign and or again number. Third, identify your position from the airport via using a bearing, distance, and altitude. If necessary, stated geographic positions. I'm over the ponds at the Hebrew airport. I'm over Durst at the Morgan airport. You know, whatever your local geographic position marks, go ahead and use those. But after you've used your mileage, altitude, and distance, and bearing from the airport, 
it just gives everybody, at least my mind goes like that. If somebody says it, it's like, okay, I'll be, I, yeah, that guy's three miles northwest. That's where I'll be looking for it. State the intentions. What are you going to be doing later? And I forgot one thing at the end of the call. State the airport that you're operating out of again. So my example, Heber Valley Airport, Glider, Gulf Sierra, three miles northwest, 7,000 feet, over the ponds, inbound for landing. We'll be entering a left crosswind, runway 22, Heber Valley, or Heber City. Paramount that we start practicing this, using this, giving other pilots in the area uh, the opportunity to get a situational awareness of where the traffic is. The aircraft that come in that state at the end, and I wish I would have printed this, maybe I'll edit this document. At the end of their statement, they say, any other aircraft in the area, please advise, I think is bogus. It says in the aim, and again, I don't have the paragraph reference, this shall not be used for transmissions. And I think the reason it should not be used is that it might give that pilot a false sense of, oh, I know where the traffic is. So if the jet pilot's coming in and we hear a lot of them at Heber, any other traffic in the area, please advise. You know, if one airplane says, well, this is Cessna 123, and I'm six miles to the south inbound, and nobody else says anything, that pilot of the jet would think, wow, oh, boy, there's only one aircraft. Again, we operate out of airports that don't require a two-way radio. There could be, you know, old airplanes that aren't using that. So I think it behooves us to keep our, you know, neck on a swivel, our eyes out looking for other traffic. Don't use that, any other traffic advice, and be concise and precise on radio communications close to your airport. Keep the radio transmissions to a minimum. Uh, Chit chat on 22.8 is not a good thing because Morgan, Heber, and quite a few other airports in the area are chit chatting on it, and it really blocks the uh, frequency for people to make necessary calls. So please keep it, transmissions to a minimum, short, sweet, and simple. And when you're out of the airport traffic area, switch the frequency. Go to 23.3, go to fingers, one, two, three, four, five. If you want to communicate with other gliders, and uh, start chit-chatting on that frequency. So that's my safety spiel for tonight. You guys can expect coming uh, towards the end of April, I want to start putting together my weekly one-question quiz that I put out last year. I think getting people uh, to think about safety and think about soaring, even if it's one question a week, we need to be able to keep people engaged uh, in the safety aspect of our sport. So with that, how the heck do I get out of this? <laughs> Let's try this. And stop presentation. All righty. All right. Thanks, Paul. That was, that was really terrific. Um, uh, great, great, uh, great thoughts on, on radio communication. I think that's something that uh, as glider pilots, we like, we like to yak. And, and let other glider pilots know where all the great thermals are. And so uh, thanks for that reminder to be switching over to our glider-specific frequencies. Uh, very, very good. Um, any questions, folks? Paul, um, Chris Robert here from up in Morgan. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, uh, presenting. I You're welcome. It. What I want to ask about is when... You landed in Provo. We, you didn't really land out. You obviously managed your risk, and uh, you landed at an airfield where you could reasonably expect to get a tow. Um, in the club ships, the only time I've been scared is on the Wasatch Front, where the ridge was working superbly above 8,000 feet. But if you got down below 8,000, you got right. a so what is it? Is there a way that we can tell our pilots, you know, our aspiring pilots, how to manage the risk on that front? Because 
I bet if you had looked at the weather forecast and the conditions when you flew, that because of whatever factor, maybe Utah Lake, who knows what, right? below 8,000 feet, the ridge wasn't going to work anymore. Right. I hovered over down to Provo for about 45 minutes, right over the stadium, and I'd get up to 885 saying, I wish I had 9,000 to push towards the canyon, and I think I can get some lift, and I got shot down every time. So I think we just have to tell the students and club members, you know, to go on the front side of the Wasatch, especially with Utah Lake acting as that big refrigerator out there, that big cool sink that we have. You know, thermals just don't want to generate uh, unless they're close to the rocks and have a little bit more wind up there that'll take them up. So good point there, Chris. Hey, you're a fighter pilot, aren't you? I was. I'm retired now. I'm an ex-fighter pilot and happy. <laughs> you know, we had some fighter pilots come down to the Salt Lake Tower one time, and the, uh, they had to operate out of Salt Lake. They'd closed the runway at Hill. And so this colonel came in, and he said, the only three ways to get through to a fighter pilot are sarcasm, ridicule, and fear. Is that a true right. statement? And so when the F-35s come back behind the ridge at Morgan, I'd call guns, guns, guns on them from my <laughs> plane because they can't even see me on the radar. Right. I'm below their Doppler notch, and I can turn faster than they can. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, that's, that's good. Thanks for the question. Hi, Bernie. Are there any other questions, folks? If not, Just speak, speak one, now. Paul. Go ahead. Best, best months of the year to, to fly. In Eden? Yes. Well, Looking out there today, and I was drooling, it looked like a good day to be up in a sailplane. It'd be low cloud days. But uh, normally, you know, about the first to second week in May through mid-October, other than those days that you get the wave conditions and or a late warm front coming through. So that's sort of our, our window to fly. And Dave Robinson, you know, being there for so long, everybody thought, well, Nephi is the great place to soar because you can get off a lot earlier. Well, just seeing from competitions and flying down there, if it's 12, 15, 12, 30 for the launch, we're not far behind, if not with you at the Heber Valley. Even though we're a higher elevation, that wind tends to suck up Provo Canyon and start generating about the same time, not too much later. So, uh, you know, we can get off fairly early and then if we want to go someplace, have a good window to do that. So, so for those of you who are board members in the club or interested in uh, um, the commercial aspects of soaring in Utah, which we haven't been able to pull off successfully to date, um, I am the onboarding coordinator for the club, and I probably get three to five calls a week going, where did that soaring operation at Heber go? My husband and I did a flight in the 232, or we did this or that. Um, that is the place, actually. If, if anyone has any aspirations to uh, uh, start or, or continue a commercial soaring operation, that's the place, just because of its proximity to Park City and the populated areas. Um, yeah, the, the trouble... The trouble with that, unfortunately, is, you know, Heber, Heber City and Dave Robinson has said this, the reason that he dropped his commercial ride business was that he lost his facility to have handicap accessible restrooms in the hangar that he was leasing right next to his. That was one of his main reasons that he, the hangar was sold. And so Heber City requires an operating permit on the Heber Airport, if you're a commercial operator, that would require some sort of a building with handicap accessible uh, restroom facilities, you know, through the fence type of operation. So we all know flying gliders, man, you're not making any money. That would be a hard thing to do other than if 
you know, OK3 Air started a glider ride business up there. So I don't think it's viable at the Hebrew Report uh, for that reason. Thanks for that. But uh, sadly, in Utah, uh, that is the only place that would be viable logistically for a potential client. Yeah, just because of the Park City flow, for sure. Awesome, folks. Uh, any, any last questions? All right, uh, uh, Paul, uh, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. That was uh, a, a super great. Um, uh, this has been recorded, and it will be posted on our website uh, probably by the end of the weekend. Um, for everybody else, I want to remind you that our next soaring seminar is next week, Wednesday, February 17th at 7.30 p.m. That will be Lynn Alley doing a presentation on wave soaring. So uh, hope to see all of you guys there. And again, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. Remember the art of Utah Soaring Association presentation. <laughs> I'll put that in as the title. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. You, you take credit. Thanks so much for putting this together. It's, it's really great. Yep, you're, you're absolutely welcome. All right, folks, uh, have a great evening. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks.